Today we wrap up our Lenten worship series on the Lord's Prayer. Our reading today is one of the earliest versions of the Lord's Prayer. It's not found in the Bible. This is from the Didache, which is a short treatise that dates back to the first century, a short treatise of the early church. It was written in Koine Greek. We don't know who wrote it. But I'm going to read from the eighth chapter of the Didache. Normally, I would make the language in Scripture gender inclusive, but today I'm going to read it exactly as it is translated. And do not pray as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel, pray thus. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so also upon earth. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the power and the glory for all. People have been praying that prayer, more or less, for 2,000 years. Christians today, most of us, pray the Lord's Prayer regularly. It's the prayer we share the prayer that connects us not only with one another today, but with all of those who, is, who have gone before us in the Christian tradition. It is an ancient prayer that always has seemed to resonate with those who have prayed it. And it continues to be relative to, relevant excuse me, to our modern reality. Today we conclude our Lenten worship series on the Lord's Prayer Recordings of all of the sermons are posted on our website and on our Facebook page, so I won't take time to summarize the series. They're there if you're interested in reading them, listening to them. Last week, we talked about temptation or times of trial. Today, our focus is deliver us from evil. These are odd and difficult days. Of course, due to the spread of COVID-19, the majority of the United States is now restricted in our homes, except for essential activities. Plagues, epidemics, have been around for as long as humans have been around, though none has affected the day-to-day -day lives of modern Americans as much as this one has. It's interesting, though, to look back and consider how human societies have experienced epidemics and related to them in terms of their faith, in terms of their understanding of evil and good. Let's go back a few centuries to consider a perception of evil back in the 14th century. The so-called Black Death Plague broke out in East Asia. It quickly spread all over Asia and Europe and North Africa. A third of the entire population of Europe died in the Black Death Plague. Again, this is the 14th century. Perhaps as many as 200 million people died. The 14th century authorities were completely helpless. They had no idea how to slow the spread of the epidemic let alone cure it. They organized mass prayers <clears throat> and processions. <clears throat> the Black Plague itself was considered evil. In medieval art, Black Death is personified as a horrific demonic force beyond human control or comprehension. The artwork, the paintings are scary. I looked at some this week. One by Dutch painter Peter Bruegel the Elder. It's quite a name, isn't it? Peter Bruegel the Elder. One painting of his shows these tall, skinny skeletons. They're riding horses, claiming dead bodies, and tossing them into a wagon. 
If we were worshiping in person today, I know that we all would have been uplifted by images like that on the front of the bulletin, and you know that's where they would have been. The Black Death Plague was thought to be evil, though we now know that it had nothing to do with horrific demonic forces. It was fleas. It spread because fleas had become infested with bacteria, and then humans who were bitten by the fleas got the plague. But in the void of scientific understandings, <coughs> in the awareness of human vulnerability and the presence of fear of the unknown, the plague was simply considered evil, attributed to demons, or perhaps an act of judgment by God or allowed by God. It's not surprising, really, until the modern era, humans usually blame diseases or famines or droughts on malicious demons or judgment by an angry god or gods. They did not suspect the existence of bacteria and viruses. People readily believed in angels and fairies, but they could not imagine a tiny flea or a single drop of water might be the cause of the spread of a plague that could infect and kill millions of people. It was easier to think of tragedy, like widespread sickness and millions dead, in terms of evil and good, God, demons. We modern people know better now, right? We're not better people, but we know more. We don't know it all, but we benefit from some contributions of scientific understandings. For example, unlike humans in the 14th century who fell prey to the Black Death Plague, we know something about coronavirus. We know that sometime late last year, at an animal market, a mutated version of a virus, which had previously only existed in animals, made the jump from animal to human. This novel coronavirus, not being a human virus like the flu, for which we all would have some natural or acquired immunity, took off like a rocket. And until science can catch up with testing and developing a vaccine, people are at risk and we're quarantined at home. And, and incidentally, here's a fun fact. During the Black Plague, the 14th century, Henry VIII stayed in his room and allowed no one near him until the plague passed. The only tool he had to combat the plague was social isolation, sort of like us now. I guess if he did it, then we can too. So, though our ability to fight the spread of COVID-19 is limited, we understand a lot more about what's happening and what is needed to flatten the curve on the current pandemic. And yet, some pastors today are still stuck in the 14th century. Some pastors continue to talk about coronavirus in terms of evil and good. Some of them even claim that because of their supposed close connection to God, they are able to cure the coronavirus through prayer. Of course, many people, me among them, have turned to prayer as a means of spiritual sustenance through these difficult days. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about some religious leaders who have gone much further to paint the pandemic as an evil that can be cured by prayer, promising that they can overcome the devil and physically cure the virus. One pastor even claimed that he could cure the entire state of Florida. These are not French people with no followers. Texas minister Kenneth Copeland, who visited the White House last year, claims to have a method for curing coronavirus, television screens. Appearing on the Victory Channel, which his church operates, Copeland claimed to heal coronavirus-infected viewers who touched their TV. A few days later, Copeland said God had told him 
the pandemic would soon be over because Christians praying all over the country had overwhelmed its evil. He went on to add a political aspect. He said, while Christians would save the country, it was critics of President Trump who had opened the door to the pandemic in the first place with their displays of hate that had interfered with divine protection. Of course, Kenneth Copeland is not the only pastor promoting the idea that the coronavirus is an evil that can be, can be healed through religion. I bring him up not to disparage him or anyone, but as an example for how modern people continue to be stuck in ancient and problematic paradigms. Often those paradigms are sustained by religious people, by religions. And so I feel it's very important to call them out. What about you? What is your definition of evil? Think about that for a moment. Is evil something we don't understand? Something that we fear? We pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What is the evil from which we pray to be delivered? The three earliest versions of the Lord's Prayer all say, deliver us from the evil one. Who is the evil one? The one from whom Jesus, according to tradition, prayed to be delivered. I suspect many Christians imagine the devil or Satan as the evil one. Is that what Jesus had in mind? Let's remember that Jesus talked about the kingdom of God more than just about anything else. The Lord's Prayer, the prayer of Jesus, begins, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. At the heart of the Lord's Prayer, then, is this petition for God's kingdom to come on earth. The Lord's Prayer says nothing about going to heaven when we die. It's about the kingdom of God realized on earth as it already is in heaven. The kingdom is a funny word to our ears. It sounds like something out of a fairy tale. But the people of Palestine knew from experience about kings and kingdoms. They lived in one. They had been conquered by the Roman Empire. They lived in the Roman kingdom. And their emperor, their king, of course, was Caesar. Caesar was all-powerful. Caesar's image was on the coins of the kingdom. Caesar was called the Son of God. The people of Palestine, then among them Jesus and his followers, lived in a sometimes brutal kingdom that had been imposed on them and was maintained by violence. Jesus' followers knew what kingdoms were like. But in his prayer then, Jesus was talking about a kingdom not of Caesar, but of God. The Lord's Prayer was subversive because it essentially replaced the kingdom of Caesar with the kingdom of God. It's not a message that Caesar would welcome. And when Caesar and the puppet king under him, Herod, heard this kind of sentiment, which is at the heart of everything we know about Jesus' message, the inevitable result would be swift and deadly action. And on this Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, Christians remember what that action was. Jesus would be silenced. He would be crucified. That's what happened, and that's still what happens. Empire snuffs out any threat to its dominance. The evil one, then, from whom Jesus prayed to be delivered, is likely Caesar. Think about what comes next in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom. Not Caesar's kingdom, 
God's kingdom. Yes, kingdom is an archaic word in our ears. We don't live in a kingdom, right? Need we still pray every Sunday to be delivered from the evil king? Well, I imagine among us are many different understandings of what evil is, perhaps if evil exists at all. As I said last week, the idea of evil originating or personified by a devil or by Satan, it does not resonate with me. I personally don't think of evil as any kind of foreboding or supernatural force. Maybe you do, and I won't try to persuade you differently. But let me suggest another way to think about evil. Maybe evil is the empire that crucified Jesus and that crucified so many others, the Roman Empire. Maybe evil is a name for the countless, nameless, faceless domination systems of our day and throughout history. Evil values money more than people. Evil places individual freedom over public safety. Evil minimizes or discounts entirely the needs of the most vulnerable. Evil excludes, dismisses, discounts. And evil is an absence of compassion and empathy. In other words, evil is all of us, at least from time to time. We all participate at times in evil, which means that evil is not something out there. It is in here. Of course, God's realm, goodness, is in here too, in each one of us. We can still bring about the liberating and just kingdom of God on earth as it already is in heaven. We bring about God's realm wherever domination systems are toppled, people freed, souls liberated. Whenever people reject the idols of power and wealth and fame and instead build a society of equals, Whenever oppressive systems are transformed into nonviolent, humane, sustainable, liberating systems that enable people to thrive. In the realm of God, everyone has enough to eat. Everyone has bread. There's a place for everyone at the table with friendship and kindness and abundance. This bread is a symbol of the kingdom of God. And even though we can't all share the same bread today, we gather around a virtual table. This bread, this cup, is holy. So pick up whatever it is that you have gathered for communion. What you hold in your hands, whatever it is, is holy. The hand that holds it is holy. Jesus said, take, give thanks, eat, drink, share with each other. This food is like my body that I freely give. And so now, eat, drink, and remember love, either with me or with each other.